Chapter 12 of The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The Mysterious Air Balls. The American barrage had been a long distance bombardment, designed apparently to draw the Han disintegrator ray batteries into operation and so reveal their positions on the mountaintops and slopes. For the Hans, after the destruction of New York, had learned quickly that concealment of their positions was a better protection than a surrounding wall of the disintegrator ray shooting up into the sky. The Hans, however, had failed to reply with the disintegrator rays, for already this arm, which formerly they had believed invincible, was being restricted to a limited number of their military units, and their factories were busy turning out explosive rockets not dissimilar to those of the Americans in their motive power and atomic detonation. They had replied with these, shooting them from unrevealed positions and at the estimated positions of the Americans. Since the Americans, not knowing the exact location of the Han outer line, had shot their barrage over it, and the Hans had fired at unknown American positions, this first exchange of fire had done little more than to churn up vast areas of mountain and valley. The Hans appeared to be elated, to feel that they had driven off an American attack. I knew better. The next American move, I felt, would be the occupation of the air from which they had driven the Hans, and from swoopers to direct the rocket fire at the city itself. Then, when they had destroyed this, they would sweep in and hunt down the Hans man to man in the surrounding mountains. Command of the air was still important in military strategy, but command of the air rested no longer in the air, but on the ground. The Hans themselves attempted to scout the American positions from the air, under cover of a massed attack of ships in cloud bank, or beaming formation, but with very little success. Most of their ships were shot down, and the remainder slid back to the city on sharply inclined repeller rays, one of them, which had its generators badly damaged while still fifty miles out, collapsed over the city before it could reach its berth at the airport, and crashed down through the glass roof of the city doing great damage. Then followed the air balls, an unforeseen and ingenious resurrection by the Americans of an old principle of air and submarine tactics, through a modern application of the principle of remote control. The air balls took heavy toll of the morale of the Hans before they were clearly understood by them, and even afterward, for that matter. Their first appearance was quite mysterious. One uneasy night, while the pulsating growl of the distant barrage kept the nerves of the city's inhabitants on edge, there was an explosion near the top of a pinnacle not far from the Imperial Tower. It occurred at the 732nd level, and caused the structure above it to lean and sag, though it did not fall. Repair men who shot up the shafts a few minutes later to bring new broadcast lamps to replace those which had been shattered, reported what seemed to be a sphere of metal, about three feet in diameter, with a four-inch lens in it, floating slowly down the shaft as though it were some living creature making a careful examination, pausing now and then as its lens swung about like a great single eye. The moment this eye turned upon them, they said, the ball rushed down on them, crushing several to death in its vicious gyrations, and jamming the mechanism of the elevator, though failing to crash through it. Then, said the wounded survivors, it floated back up the shaft, watchfully eyeing them, and slipped off to the side at the wrecked level. The next night several of these air balls were seen, following explosions in various towers and sections of the city roof and walls. In each case, repair gangs were rushed by them, and suffered many casualties. On the third night, a few of the air balls were destroyed by the repairmen and guards, who now were equipped with disintegrator pistols. This, however, was pretty costly business, for in each case the ray bored into the corridor and shaft walls beyond its target, wrecking much machinery, injuring the structural members of that section, penetrating apartments, and taking a number of lives. Moreover, the air balls, being destroyed, could not be subjected to scientific inspection. After this, the explosion ceased, but for many days, the sudden appearances of those air balls in the corridors and shafts of the city caused the greatest confusion, and many times they were the cause of death and panic. 
At times they released poison gases, and not infrequently themselves burst, instead of withdrawing, in a veritable explosion of disease germs, requiring absolute quarantine by the Han medical department. There was an utter heartlessness about the defense of the Han authorities, who considered nothing but the good of the community as a whole, for when they established these quarantines, they did not hesitate to seal up thousands of the city's inhabitants behind hermetic barriers enclosing entire sections of different levels, where, deprived of food and ventilation, the wretched inhabitants died miserably long before the disease germs developed in their systems. At the end of two weeks, the entire population of the city was in a mood of panicky revolt. New service to the public had been suspended, and the use of all viewplates and phones in the city were restricted to official communications. The city administration had issued orders that all citizens not on duty should keep to their apartments, but the order was openly flouted, and small mobs were wandering through the corridors, ascending and descending from one level to another, seeking they knew not what, fleeing the air balls which might appear anywhere, and being driven back from the innermost and deepest sections of the city by the military guard. I now made up my mind that the time was ripe for me to attempt my escape. In all this confusion, I might have an even break in spite of the danger I might myself run from the air balls, and the almost insuperable difficulties of making my way to the outside of the city and down the precipitous walls of the mountain to which the city clung like a cap. I would have given much for my inertron belt, that I might simply have leaped outward from the edge of the roof some dark night, and floated gently down. I longed for my ultraphone equipment, with which I might have established communication with the beleaguering American forces. My greatest difficulty, I knew, would be that of escaping my guard. Once free of them, I figured it would be the business of nobody in particular, in that badly disorganized city, to recapture me. The knives of the ordinary citizens I did not fear, and very few of the military guard were armed with disintegrator pistols. I was sitting in my apartment, busying my mind with various plans, when there occurred a commotion in the city corridor outside my door. The captain of my guard jumped nervously from the couch on which he had been reclining, and ordered the excited guards to open the door. In the broad corridor, the remainder of the guard lay about, dead or groaning, where they had been bowled over by one of these air balls, the first I had ever seen. The metal sphere floated hesitantly above its victims, turning this way and that to bring its eye on various objects around. It stopped dead on sighting the door which the guard had thrown open, hesitated a moment, and then shot suddenly into the apartment with a hissing sound, flinging into a far corner one of the guards who had not been quick enough to duck. As the captain drew his disintegrator pistol, it launched itself at him with a vicious hiss. He bounded back from the impact, his chest crushed in, while the pistol, which fortunately had fallen with its muzzle pointed away from me, shot a continuous beam that melted its way instantly through the apartment wall. The sphere then turned on the other guard, who had thrown himself into a corner where he crouched in fear. Deliberately it seemed to gauge the distance and direction. Then it hurled itself at him with another vicious hiss, which I now saw came from a little rocket motor, crushing him to death where he lay. It swung slowly around until the lens faced me again and floated gently into position level with my eye, seeming to scan me with its blank four-inch eye. Then it spoke with a metallic voice. If you are an American, it said, answer with your name, gang, and position. I am Anthony Rogers, I replied, still half bewildered, boss of the Wyomings. I was captured by the Hans after my swooper was disabled in a fight with a Han airship and had drifted many hundred miles westward. These Hans you have killed were my guard. Good, ejaculated the metal ball. We have been hunting for you with these remote control rockets for two weeks. We knew you had been captured. A Han message was picked up. Close the door of your room and hide this ball somewhere. I have turned off the rocket power. Put it on your couch, throw some pillows over it, get out of sight. We'll speak softly so no Hans can hear, and we'll speak only when you speak to us. The ball I found was floating freely in the air. So perfectly was it balanced with ultron and inertron that it had about the weight of a spider web. 
Ultimately, I suppose, it would have settled to the floor, but I had no time for such an idle experiment. I quickly pushed it to my couch, where I threw a couple of pillows and some of the bedclothes over it. Then I threw myself back on the couch with my head near it. If the dead guards outside attracted attention, and the Han patrol entered, I could report the attack by the air ball and claim that I had been knocked unconscious by it. One moment, said the ball, after I reported myself ready to talk. Here is someone who wants to speak to you. And I nearly leaped from the couch with joy when, despite the metallic tone of the instrument, I recognized the eager, loving voice of my wife, almost hysterical in her own joy at talking to me again. End of chapter 12